Hi, this is Paul. Uh, sense making. I had a conversation with um, David Fuller today, and he, he recorded it, so it might show up on Rebel Wisdom. The channel Rebel Wisdom has been focusing on sense making, and it took me a while to try to understand what they made by meant by sense making. And in a lot of ways, it's been well. We've got all these illustrations currently. So in the United States. Did uh, Joe Biden just win because Trump's an idiot, or did the Democrats steal the election? How are you going to decide? You're probably deciding based on what tribe you're in. And is that going to tell you the truth, or is that just going to make you yell and reinforce what the people around you are saying? Um, or let's talk about COVID. Is the, are the current measures of trying to control the spread of the virus effective, or do they do more harm than good? This has been a debate pretty much from the beginning. Is this thing overdone? Is this a uh, conspiracy to try to seize power, to remake the world in a whole new woke way? What's going on with that? How can you tell? How do you know? Who do you trust? How, how can you make sense of all of the data coming your way, increasingly from a host of new sources. We used to have a mass media that reinforced a particular narrative, and now that's fractured, and so people just believe according to their tribes. To hit another issue, climate change. Is this thing overblown? Is it, is it, is it real? How are you supposed to figure it out? Well, we're going to count scientists, but we're going to look at models that were done 20 years ago and haven't seemed to come to fruition, but high levels of CO2, yada, yada, yada. Again, you can comment, you can argue that in the comment section if you want to. It's sense-making. And so all of these things are way up there. Does that impact your life? Um, should that be a priority for you? We've got sides all up and down yelling that, well, this is the most important thing, so you'd better do this or you'd better do that, and our very future depends on it. Well, how can you know? Lots of people act as if they do know, and they will reward you for lining up with them, and they will punish you for even just not lining up with them or not making the required noises whenever those noises are demanded. That's the world that we're living in. Now, in the IDW space, David Fuller and I sort of, well, he left his work at a, you know, at, at BBC4, I think that was it, where he worked with Kathy Newman, and he flew to Toronto and was very interested in Jordan Peterson and made, got an interview before Jordan Peterson's wave really lifted him up into the stratosphere and made Glitch in the Matrix, and off he went. And David, of course, was very active in what's sometimes called men's work. Um, some of you are familiar with those kinds of things. There have been Christian aspects of them. John Van Donk has been on my channel a number of times, and he you know, very much appreciated the work of Richard Rohr. And David has been, I think, um, more courageous and outspoken, whether you agree with him or not, about his disappointment in the IDW. It seemed something fresh, alive, full of potential, and then sort of got decadent. And I've, I've talked about Jordan Peterson's book tour as decadence. Um, I've listened to quite a bit of uh, Brett and Heather and Eric, and they've gotten rather monotonous. And is that decadence is that decadence coming into into their um, their products is decadence inevitable and so David has continued on rebel wisdom to try to bring in new voices and in, in some ways I think trying to see if lightning will strike twice or the magic will happen again but as I know you know in, in a lot of ways I've seen what he's done there at rebel wisdom has been very parallel to um, to church ministry in a lot of ways. Of course, he's he makes videos, and what many of us see are the videos, but there's this whole other layer of the work that they do along alongside of the videos and, and really apart from where the cameras are rolling. And so this past Monday, he invited me to participate in a group that they have, mostly meeting on Zoom, and the topic of the group was collapse of sense making, and it was sort of in response to my video, "Why is YouTube boring you now?" And 
you know, I really enjoyed being in that group, and it reminded me of a lot of um, a lot of church work that I've done over the years. And and even though um, you know we didn't talk about Jesus or anything like that, um, it was really quite a delight to get a little window into their community and the conversations and the kinds of things they're talking about. It was really quite delightful. But the topic was a collapse in sense making and and why, you know, it seemed three years ago that YouTube and Jordan Peterson on it it's demonstrating its power as a tool that this was really going to transform things. We hear Eric Weinstein talking about long form podcasting and the popularity of Joe Rogan and, and and this is all supposed to lead to what exactly? Change all of our minds and and it's almost always seen almost exactly the way that the media sees churches, which is, well, the main function of churches is that they reliably get out the vote for a particular side or another. And if you think it's just all Christians voting for Republicans, well, you might read someone like Jack Jenkins and find that there are many Christians out there. In fact, pretty much in the United States, it's split down the middle. Half of the people who identify as Christians vote Democratic and half of the people vote Republican. But if you look at the focus on the news, it's always churches are a function of a political outcome, which will be, you know, votes for Trump or votes for Biden. And where will the Catholic vote go on and on and on as if, well, that's really the only aspect of church life that really matters, how how church people vote. And it's imagined that, well, pastors are up there telling people how to vote and they're going to vote that way. And as a pastor, I can tell you, I tell people things all the time that they simply ignore or don't do or don't care to do. Um, that's the way it goes. That doesn't mean that pastors don't have influence. It just means that, well, pastors are, there've been some stories coming out of West Michigan, some colleagues of mine in the CRC, Keith Manis, for example, who had a congregation in Saugatuck recently, Article 17, he didn't resign from the ministry. There's some technicalities in here that are important, but he decided to separate from that congregation over basically political disagreements. And I knew Keith Manis a bit in college and seminary, always someone I respected. And, you know, the little, I haven't been anywhere near him in terms of my career since then, but always respected the man. But, you know, these things play out, and as always, the, the reality on the ground is far more complex than these narratives that are promoted in the news. You know, Sevilla um, did a video, did a sort of a, a response video to one of my videos recently, uh, Sevilla King on the quality experience Oh, I always get the channel name wrong, but her channel hasn't grown much, and that's really a shame because, you know, Sevilla's been pursuing the work around Persig with Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance and and um, I think this, um, Lila, I don't know the second book. I don't know Persig at all, and I haven't watched that many of her videos. Um, Sevilla and I have had a conversation, and and she's just a she's just a really delightful person, and her her patience and attention and uh, focus on 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 making sense of the world has has been really admirable. She also had a wonderful conversation with Jonathan Peugeot, so you can Google my conversation with her, and you can uh, Google Jonathan Peugeot's conversation with her. And um, but you know she did a response video, and it was interesting the things from my video that she picked up on about decadence and going back to the well and and needing you know what you need to not only find refreshment and not fall into decadence, but to um, remain vital, avoid repetition, um, and and really avoid a collapse in sense making. To be persistent in sense making, which I think, if you look at Sevilla's channel, that's that's very much what she's what she's been doing. Now, I talk a lot on YouTube. That should be obvious. But when I have a local meetup, and I, I like to get chances to listen, to listen outside my own bubble, to listen to you, to read the comment section, to skim the Discord, to now, now again, all of that is all of that is biased because obviously any groups downstream of my work, very quickly we provide we create an echo chamber and even small amounts of status bind and blind and so it was really a treat to to be welcomed into the rebel wisdom sense making 
event and to listen. And so many thoughtful, articulate, really generous and wonderful people sharing their thoughts and just was able to glean a whole bunch of points from it. You know, it's basically narrative collapse in the attentionist economy. I got that word. Again, I'm a pastor. So when you say something that rings a bell, I'm going to write it down. I'm going to keep it. I'm going to use it. And uh, I might not know your name, so you might not get credit. But so I'm warning you, if you say it in front of me, I might I might grab it. I just had a conversation with um, with um, Griswold Grimm, who's in the who's in the discord. And he's one of the guys now on sorting yourself out that channel on YouTube and just have a wonderful conversation with him and I'll because I kind of go monologue conversation, monologue conversation. If in fact I post this monologue, um, I'll probably post uh, let's see, today's Wednesday, Thursday, I'll probably post my conversation with um, Griswold Grimm on Friday. I had fun with that conversation. Learned so much. He he just was he was just just laying out these phrases that I just kept typing down because of the, I'm going to rip those things off. But, but anyway, from the, from the rebel wisdom community, you know, talked obviously a lot about co, uh, COVID isolation and mosaic and malaise, too much thinking, too little acting and doing because of COVID, because we're all sort of, you know, bound up by these restrictions. Um, the stories are playing themselves out was another, was another observation, which I thought was really good. A uh, social political, uh, caring demand exhaustion, especially after a presidential election in the United States. It's just this this constant drumbeat of you must care, you must care, you must care, and and you must care to to save the country from from Trump or from Biden. And again, it's almost always from and not for, because you're you're much more concerned about stopping the platform of the other than than actually having a good platform of your own. Now, that's sort of in alignment with the American political structure, which basically makes it very difficult to get anything done. And that's actually by design of the of the Constitution. It just sort of puts a brakes on everything. But the, the political discourse in the United States has, has gotten so negative. They could have just printed in the, ball, the ballot, you know, anybody but Trump or anybody but Biden. And because the other one would be the other choice, well, we're far more often voting against than voting for. And you know, it's it's uh, you've got to care about COVID. You've got to care about racism. You've got to care about um, wokeism. You've got to care. You've got to care. And it's like, I can't care anymore. I'm anxious and I'm exhausted. Counter narratives are congealed. So, you know, when Jordan Peterson came up, it seemed like a, a breath of fresh air. And Joey and the in the Discord and in the local meetups said, you know, many times he said, it's Jordan Peterson gave us words for what we were feeling and arguments that we could use to um, to basically resist other things pushing at us and demanding that we care. You know, maybe not even do, just say the words and perform the ritual and bend the knee. Um, but, but all those counter narratives have congealed and they're mapped territory. And so we hear... You know, how many examples do we need to hear from Brett and Heather about the catastrophe that is Portland? Now, granted, that's the city that they love and it's the city that they live in and it's falling apart and they want to get the news out. And basically, by virtue of that whole job, you have to repeat and repeat and repeat and repeat. And the idea is that you just basically keep running up the the YouTube and the podcast and the Twitter analytics because maybe you've got five or six figures of followers on a particular platform, but there are potentially seven and eight um, eight figures out there and, and compared still to the mass media, uh, those are relatively small numbers. And so it's, you know, I think about Horton Hears a Who, the old cartoon cartoon vision or version where, you know, the... Uh, the monkeys are trying to get the elephant to throw the the flower into the boiling cauldron and all the little who's that are on a little, that little speck of dust on the flower. We are here. We are here. We are here. And, well, you know, after one or two years of we are here, we are here, you, you sort of wear out. An algorithm opt optimized for reinforcement so that we are here, we are here, just, you know, we've got five channels of we are here. It's like, okay, I know you're here. Yeah, but everybody needs to know. <laughs> I just I just 
can't take it anymore. You know, bring in, bring in Kanye West, uh, Kanye West, and Alex Jones just to bring in the court jesters for some entertainment because the the king and democracy. It's imagined the American people. We're all sitting on the throne, and and it's just one request after another and a demand for judgment and a demand for decision. So bring in the court jester and, and have them do something that refreshes. And, and, you know, part of what's wonderful about conversation is that so often, and this was true of my conversation with, with David, that another person will pull out from you what was in there but you couldn't say and just the way they engage with you new things new some of the some of the consciousness congress that was sort of sitting on the sidelines and couldn't quite get to the microphone some things come out and so i talked to david about the you know the personas in the arena that really wasn't what i thought of but after that was exactly what i said but upon more thinking remember thinking fast and slow it takes time for for the things to sort of bubble up. And, and so we have these platforms out there. We have Twitter and YouTube and Instagram and podcasts and, and all of that. And, and, and when we're operating in these platforms, we're personas. We, we don't bring our whole self. And again, as a, as a Christian minister, I know this because part of fulfilling an office in a church is that you become a persona. And so you have a ministerial persona. And and that's you know the the video about about placebos. The doctors have a persona. Politicians have a persona. Teachers have a persona. I mean, we we all have these personas to to operate in a specific arena. Sorry about the sound levels. This computer sometimes turns down my sound and it doesn't ask me. So my sound levels are a little bit up now. And so when I start getting going again, if you got to turn it down, you might have to turn it down. <laughs> I was talking to David and I said, you know, well, I just usually record it on Zoom. And he looked at me like, oh, <clears throat> you are a pastor. You are not a journalist. Look at the quality of this channel. Anyway. So, so we have these platforms, and, and we're, we take on these personas, and you have to on a particular platform, but you have an agent arena relationship, and the, and the platforms only permit certain bandwidth, certain wavelengths from the personas. That's, that's basically how it works. You can't bring your full person onto the platform because... That's not what the platform is. And even, even in, in a real life situation, there's, there's only so much of you you bring to the table and you bring into the room. And, and so, you know, we talked about how does Twitter shape the persona? I mean, Twitter, Twitter, Twitter tempts us. And I remember Jordan Peterson dealing with his Twitter persona and, and having to stop some of these things, because obviously the more status he had, the more closely he was watched, the bigger players would attack, the bigger the players who would attack them. Now, you know, anybody of any status, you know, why bother attacking Paul Vanderclay? I mean, some people say, oh, he's got 15,000 YouTube subscribers, but you know, how many hundred million subs does PewDiePie have? So Vander Clay's a pretty small fish. But but Twitter shapes the persona and 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 that persona then, and you gotta be really careful with that, turns back and and shapes the person. And and the agent um, beneath it becomes obscure and intentionally sub obscure and obscured. And in many ways, the, the, the more status you gain, the more you have to obscure, the more you have to hide because the more of the actual agent beneath the persona that you reveal, well, the more there is to attack. And, and so these platforms shape and contain and limit and flatten and again, I brought up um, uh, Venkatesh Rao's uh, "The Internet of Beefs," which was just a terrific, terrific piece. I mean, you build a plot, you build a following with a platform-shaped persona, and that persona then sort of captures you because you're you're only allowed to be that persona. And if you stray from being that persona, you may derail your 
your the growth that you need in order to, as you imagine, grow your influence and and grow your pr- your presence on the platform and maybe colonize other platforms and get book deals and and on and on and on and um, uh, Griswold Grimm, you know, talked about Jordan Peterson and the the life. Uh, Sevilla talked about same the same thing. The at our local meetup when we talked about the book tour. Um, you know, when you went to one of those book tour events, you went to one too many and I went to three or four and, you know, I basically only went to them because there were members of our group who hadn't been to any. So yeah, I'll go with you and, and we'll go together and we'll talk about it and we'll make meaning together. And we'll, we'll talk about how this is, is showing signs of decadence and, and it's, yeah. And again, C. Sevilla's C. Sevilla's commentary on my video, I think I thought she really pulled out some of those themes nicely. And, and so you're only allowed to be a certain persona, and then you're punished by the mooks. And, and you have to follow the mooks. There go my mooks. I must go out, get out in front, and lead them to exactly where the mooks want me to go. And, and again, this is, this is old hat for, for churches and clergy. Um, very quickly your tradition, but also your membership. And so again, my friend Keith Manis in Western Michigan um, just wanted to get out of his church. And I'm sure there's been plenty of examples going the other way as well. And, and it's sort of like your family of origin. You know, when you're um, when you're with your family, they maybe treat you like you were 8 or 10 or 12 years old. And then in turn, you respond to them like you did when you were 8 or 10 or 12. The, the system sort of sort of locks you in. And the irony is that the, the higher and bigger you grow on a platform, the more that platform is going to restrict you. And this gets into the whole... Um, Meta divine realm and and small g gods and and all of those things is the same dynamics are at work. The the bigger you get, though, the platform is going to try to constrain you, and the platform will increasingly make its demands on you. Part of what we've seen out of especially the Weinstein's is is the is the heightened interest in the political layer. Now, I think it's a failure of imagination to think that the political layer is the most determinative layer. Remember, politics is now, not no, now. Politics is now and religion is always, and politics is often no. And, and we're seeing the platformed, flattened version of, of each of these. There was an interesting conversation between Katie Couric and, and um, uh, David Brooks that you can find on YouTube. And I know it'll trigger some of you, but, you know, live dangerously. But you know, you be you become who on Twitter you are your persona on Twitter, and and so you know the media, People Magazine feed off things like this. Well, let's go visit their house. Let's get a more rounded view of them. And in some ways, it's you know it's trash mags. But but the reason it works is because part of us knows we're only getting a little bit of them, and maybe we like what we're seeing, and so then we want more of them. But as Warren Mills mentioned when he went and saw Big Daddy Don Garlitz and a kid growing up in Australia building his own race cars and, and loving races and hot rod magazines, gets to the United States and visits Big Daddy Don Garlitz. And Warren Mills to say, says to me, you know the old adage about never meet your heroes? It's true. Because you fall in love with the persona, and that's who the person is in your mind. But when you meet the living, breathing human being, it's way more contact. It's way more complex and potentially disappointing. And so we 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 demonize. You know, for our own reasons, we have to divinize and demonize these people that we see, and, and so we do, and we we flatten them out, and so. You know, what What about Joe Biden and his son? It's his son. He loves him. Is he going to have a weak spot for his son? Yeah. That's why judges recuse themselves. If a judge, if a, if a son came to in the courtroom of a father who was a judge for a DUI, you know, our system says, no, we don't let that stand. It's his son. He's biased. It's his son. We can't understand this. Or how about Donald Trump? Now, does Donald Trump care about no one besides himself? I think he probably loves his daughter and his children 
in in the way that he loves. And and you're not going to find, you know, the, the, the greatest enemy or the greatest hero. I mean, you're going to find human beings behind these personas. And and that's who they are. And they're full of strengths and weaknesses and beauty and ugliness and and complexity. Back when I was preaching on the Sermon on the Mount, you know, I used uh, Rebel Wisdom did a, a, a video with uh, Jim Rutt and, and Brett Weinstein on Game B, and you know, I I'm always teeing off this stuff. I'm always looking for illustrations for my sermon, and yeah, Game B. Why? Because the world needs saving. Okay, well, why don't you look at how people have saved the world before? Many world changers have written no books. Now, of course, I'm partial to Jesus. I'm a Christian minister, but Siddhartha Gautama didn't write any books. Um, Jesus never wrote a book. And, and for many of these world changers, we, we mostly know them through their disciples, and, and we know them through the way that their disciples were impacted. Their disciples were transformed. You find in the book of Acts where... Um, you know, you find in the book of Luke that the disciples are kind of a hapless, unreliable group, you know, one of which then sells out Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. By the time we find them after the day of Pentecost in the book of Acts, it's their boldness that, that, that surprises people and, and, and the religious leaders just say, well, they were with Jesus and, and somehow, the people were transformed and, and a culture was communicated and, and, and something got contagious that on one hand was problematic and dissonant compared to some of the major players in terms of how they thought the world should go. And, and this subversive little better idea supplants them. They embody a superior form of community almost always. People wanted to be a part of them. People wanted um, what they had. You know, maybe, maybe they they weren't sure they wanted to join them, but they sure were glad they were in the world. That's powerful stuff. People would deny themselves rather than denying their neighbors. You know, I, I you know, I, I completely understand all the anxiety about wokeness, but when I compare it even to forms that I saw in the 60s and 70s, today's version looks just just, just, just absolutely impotent because, as I've said many times, I saw in the 60s and 70s people would sacrifice their futures. And, and I don't mean in some grand heroic statement. I mean in the way that a mother and a father sacrifice their futures for their children. In, in the way that, that people would move into, a, move into a decaying community to spend their lives pouring themselves out for people that would in all likelihood not be able to be rescued. But they did so because, well, that's how they would change the world. Last night, my wife started watching the Netflix series on Scientology, and it was very interesting listening to some of the defectors saying, you know, I joined Scientology because it was supposed to save the world, and I just wound up being part of an organization that was bent on just trying to keep the sheep in the fold. Uh, to To my dismay, how many Christians can say exactly the same thing? I mean, it's true, and I know some some of you are always sort of cheering when I talk that way about the church because, well, I do love the church, and you know, if you want to have a, a theme for this video, it's it's Bill Hybels theme that the, you know, the the church is the hope of the world, and a lot of you look at it and say, well, if that's the hope, I don't want to have anything to do with it, and that's that's to the dismay and the shame of the church, but but that's that's been a constant. It, it's almost always. Uh, tears among the wheat. It's almost always, you know, two steps forward, one step back, or sometimes two steps back and one step forward. But but that's that's how the world has changed. You know, Jesus conquered the Roman Empire who killed him in less than 300 years. It's an astounding thing, but it's a historical fact. Look at the power of Methodism and, you know, dealing with, you know, part of the the beauty of Tom Holland's 
Tom Holland's thesis in his book is this reformatio, this this reformation, this constant self-examination and constant can we do better. And and I know that really annoys some people. And it's it's embodied in the left hand part of the of the of the national um weakened Christian humanist zeitgeist, but this this constant question of can we do better? Can we be kinder? Can we be stronger? And and Methodism grew both in terms of, you know, leaders like like John and Charles Wesley and and, you know, well, not really a Methodist, but George Whitfield, this, you know, Calvinist preacher, but but more so by the groups, by the by these small groups of people who were holding together and trusting one another and irritating one another and encouraging one another and being frustrated by each other. But they, they hung together and, and they slowly became the little groups that knit together a world. And you saw this in the Protestant Reformation, the conventicles that were these little outcast people. They didn't just leave the church in a huff and be a Christian all by their lonesome. They found other little groups and they met together for you know, in Christian terms, of course, for prayer and for mutual encouragement and 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 confession of their sins and and mutual admonition and that that those became the building block of the Protestant Reformation. But but even in the areas of Europe that were resistant to the Tref- Reformation, you find that there were these these lay organizations that were also out there, and everybody understood in both the, the parts of Europe that. That where the you know the Protestant Reformation really took hold, and the plot, plot, parts that it didn't, that there was rampant corruption in the clergy, but but it was almost always in the in the layer of these of these of these groups, these confederations of lay people who, uh, you know, they'd listen to the clergy, and you know they were loyal, semi loyal, and you know they they had all the kinds of qualms about their leaders that we do today. But what they did was stick with each other. And, and you find this pattern. I mean, my knowledge, of course, is, is biased towards, towards Christianity and Western Europe. But you, I, I, I'm, I bet you you find these patterns all over the world. I know that you know, even communists had these little communist cells and you know, terrorist groups have that. It's nothing changes without groups of people committed to one another together for a cause, but but the cause, the, the balance between their devotion to each other and their devotion to the cause, it's never all lopsided because if it's all devotion to the cause, then you, know, you can't cohere the groups. I've been listening to Dan Carlin's hardcore history and you, know, you, see, this in, you see this in military units. This is how people are. This is the story of the world. You're going to change the world Pay attention to this. You say, yeah, but I need to change the world now. Okay. Good luck. It's not how the world is changed. Every major change in the world happens because it seems to happen now, but it's been building and growing. And, you know, if you. If you look at the Protestant Reformation so often, if you a low resolution view of it, Luther not, nailed the 95 theses and whoop, there's the Protestant Reformation fully fully you know yielded. but read the histories of it. There are lots of precursors to the Reformation and it, it doesn't look like this one defining event. It's just we can put a name to it and a time on it. and so that's how we it sticks in our minds. But if you look at the the history, it's far broader, far slower um, and has to do with everything with individ, individual personal relationships and commitments one to another. If you can't commit to another human being and have that have, have be decent enough to have those people commit to you, your your thing will never last. Can't get C.S. Lewis's Miracles book out of my head. You know, Lewis talks about nature, um, which is from the Greek physis, and nat and nature, and it grows. It goes on its own. That's the whole idea of nature. It's 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 seemingly purposeless, but something interrupts the process, halting it, redirecting it, employing the strength of the thing it's colonizing. It's so funny when John Verveke is like, where's Vanderclay talking about colonizing? And then he read Lewis and he's like, yeah, I see where he's getting. It's from Lewis because that's what happens. And of course, Lewis connects this up with reason, that reason somehow 
reason invades and colonizes and it's and it's not that nature is immune to it it nature seems a willing um witting host to it and and nature seems seems ready to receive her king and and it's motivated by a desire for a higher or a better thing that justifies the the sacrifice and the self denial and and when masses of people live your well-being at my expense, you build for the future rather than eating the decaying residue of the past. You know, I, I listened to um, David, is it Gronowski, has the radio show. He and I had a conversation a while ago. He, he, he's, he's interviewed quite a few important people, has a little radio show in Southern Florida, and he, he interviewed Mencius Molbug, um, um, Yarvin. And, and Yarvin had a few questions in there that I thought were just so good. You know, he said, you know, how would you compare yourself to your ancestors in 1920? Are you better or worse? And he asked that question. I thought, yeah, that's a good question. Because suddenly the values come to the fore. And, well, you have more money. Okay. You have more education. Okay. But... They could do things that you can't do. And, and you know, he said, you know, I, I wonder if, if those people, how they would deal with the problems we have today. You know, in 1920, they had just survived the Spanish flu, which, you know, killed more people and, and ran through the culture in more serious ways and on and on. But the question has a lot of hidden complexity in it because there's a lot of ideas and practices of those people from 100 years ago, your descendants, your ancestors from 100 years ago that that you might not esteem, you might, as C.S. Lewis noted, he said, you know, we, kindness is so high, and this is C.S. Lewis writing in the 40s and 50s, kindness is so high in our, he didn't use these words, in our, our value hierarchy, and we despise previous generations because kindness wasn't as high in theirs, but what virtues did they employ that we despise? Yeah, really important point. And when I look at, even if I look at just the history of the Christian Reformed Church, these these Dutch immigrants who came over with nothing, they sacrificed and they clung together. And yeah, they argued and they fought and there was other things that weren't terribly good in it. But you know what? They built stuff. They built institutions. They built, they built churches. They built schools. They built retirement homes. They built businesses. They, they built and they sacrificed and they cohered. Recently, my um, uh, a cousin sent my sister some pictures of my grandparents when they were young. And here's a picture of my grandmother in the 1920s. And I know the story because she, you know, she, she graduated eighth grade and then she went basically to a, a secretarial school. My grandmother was a brilliant woman, an incredible memory, you know, went on to write in a, in a books in a banner article and these are pretty significant things for a woman at that time. But there's a picture of my grandmother probably in her early 20s standing on, you know, some downtown street in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And I know that she went to work every day and the money that she made at work, she brought home and gave to her father who was ill. And, and she had been saving up because she and my grandfather were going to marry. So they were putting money aside and then the roof on the family home needed replacing. And so there went all her savings. And my grandfather and my grandmother never made much money. They pastored during the Depression, and she even wrote a banner article, um, uh, like two cents and 13 pounds of butter. They needed something. And, you know, well, do we have any money? We've just got these pennies, but we've got 13 pounds of butter and you know, in the house because all of the Dutch CRC dairy farmers didn't have any cash, and so they were paying their tithes in in farm products. But what does family? What does a family need with thirteen pounds of butter? Yeah, we are lesser sons of greater parents in many ways. And but but when you ask the question, how do you? What's the value hierarchy? that you use to compare yourself to your ancestors. Well, in many ways, they were unnatural. They sacrificed. They had self-denial. They had determination. They had community. And 
when you listen to people wax nostalgia about the past, it's usually those kinds of things. And so I, I said to David, I said, you know, a lot of the IDW people have signed, kind of become pundits. And if you're a pundit, you're on a political stage and you're one of those noisemakers. And, you know, the mooks would all be excited if, if Brett Weinstein was elevated to the, the ranks of one of those pundits that sits, on the, sits at the desk of CNN. And how many times wasn't Jordan Peterson on Fox News? And, you know, Brett Weinstein was on Fox News. And, and you know, Eric has his disc and how people are excluded and institution, institutions resist. And, yeah, that's true. But, you know, I was, you know, before I made the Weinstein video that I did recently, I listened to some of his earlier podcasts and he had a much more well-rounded vision of, you know, let's form community. And, and, and Eric, you know, I know he, he, he did go and, and maybe he still does, you know, he tried out Instagram and he went into the portal and I want to give him credit for that. And, and then he in one podcast he talked about well some of the the mentally <laughs> the mentally hazardous people who are you know yeah I understand that you never hear knock knock on my door when I'm doing a podcast I get it but that's that's the price and 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 again you know one person that's a big part of the problem is one person can't do all this you need to build beneath you but but not and. An institution, yes, but the, the, the community creates the institution. And again, I, I look at churches because part of the, the decadence of the, the mega church in the late 20th, early 21st century is that as opposed to the churches all the way up until the 60s and 70s when there were mostly volunteers and very few paid staff. Now suddenly everything is professionalized and the show has to go on stage and the music has to be right. And, and it's all a performance and a show. And, you know, some people have tuned into the Living Stones uh, stream, church stream on Sunday morning. And, you know, I prefer a church that kind of, does its own thing and embodies its community. And, you know, I actually, when it comes to a lot of what happens at the church, I, I want the people at church here to, to do what they think is best. And, you know, if I've got agreements or disagreements, I usually keep my mouth shut because it's not my church. It's the body of Christ and it belongs to its master. And so, Jesus seems pretty doggone tolerant of a whole lot of stuff that we look at and think probably shouldn't be, and maybe it shouldn't be, but again, the parable of the wheat and the tares, he'll sort it out when he's good and ready in his own time. And, and so do you want to start a movement? Yeah, I understand you're going to have to get your social media subs up high and you're going to have to have your podcast and you're going to have to get your voice out there. And I understand all of that. But again, I go back to the Jordan Peterson moment. And I always, in a lot of those earlier videos, reflected on the difference between Jordan Peterson and someone like Billy Graham. You know, Billy Graham would roll into town and before he ever got there, a year or two before, there was outreach going to the churches. Why? Because, well, you can get up on stage and you can grab the big crowd and you can have the big show. But if, if, if real change, not only in individual lives, but in the culture is going to be sustained, you need small groups of people face to face, heart to heart, doing all the annoying, boring, long-term relational work one to another, knitting together the culture and the organization of which the institution is sort of a, is sort of hopefully something like an exoskeleton that molts and reshapes and molts and reshapes as the thing organically grows. That's how the world changes. And, you know, when in all of the estuary talk that we've done, you know, why haven't I established estuary, <laughs> the estuary organization and, and put myself on top of it and, and grabbed, you know, Vendank and, 
and Job and Joey and Rick and Tyler and made them the board members. And no, I'm not looking to put us all on a surfboard and ride a wave. I want us to build a sandbar that's going to shape the level of the sea. Well, how does that happen? Well, ask yourself what limestone is. Ask yourself, you know, how the world gets shaped by by all of these 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 organisms that grow and grow. How did we get all this oxygen in the atmosphere that we're crowding out with the CO2? What does it take? What does it take? Peterson's focus was on the individual, and I think that's part of the reason his wave was so large because he quite amazingly spoke directly to the individual and and people were changed. And even recently, when even though his channel has some of the reruns on from his book tour, I still see comments in there that, that grabbed my attention in the first place. You know, I'm just so grateful to the man because he saved me. Job did a did a conversation with someone on the Discord recently that, you know, made all the same noises and you know, he reached out to the individual, but you know, part of why I started this channel was I knew there were going to be some individuals out there and of course, you know, my little channel is only a tiny fraction of those who found Peterson, but this is how people change. This is how we stay together. And, you know, nights come and go, but if you can be something, if you can transcend and be something more than a mook, and if you can, if you can work together and sacrifice one another and not sacrifice each other, sac sacrifice for each other, you know, you can change the world. That's what these guys want to do. Oh, we don't have enough time. Oh, okay. Tell me your plan. Is it politics? Really? Because every two, three years with a new, again, remember, not too long ago, I remember all of the Democratic, all of the candidates for the Democratic nomination on the stage pledging that climate change was their first priority. Well, climate change got pushed out by racism or and then the pandemic, or getting rid of Trump, or, or, or that's the nature of politics. Always has been, always will be. You want to change the world? Build the sandbar. Can you work in faith for a future you can't secure and that you yourself will never see? It's part of the reason religious organizations really thrive long term compared to political ones. A fear of a future, but little faith in one from a secular perspective, that's a real liability. And so, you know, I talked to David and, you know, saw all the people gathering for, for that little convocation and the little talk and thought, you know, this is not an add-on. This is the meat of the work because the group does the sense-making. You learn from each other. It's, you know, distributed cognition. No, each, no, each one of us is smart enough because partly because we're all looking from our own perspective. And so we have to listen to each other. And if we're, if we're slow to speak and quick to listen, gosh, where do I get those phrases from? If, if we're quick to, if we're slow to speak and quick to listen, we might learn something and we might gain in wisdom and we might, we might grow together and, you know, we might practice dialogos in a Vervakian way and, and fellowship and, and, and at the end of the conversation, we might be richer for having listened and Jordan Peterson rule. Imagine that the person you're talk to, talking to knows something that you don't and be humble enough to take it in and to grow from it, even if it challenges your political or religious or ideological preconceptions. The world is messy like that, always has been. So the group does the sense-making. You discover, you embody, you reinforce, you discipline. And, and, and this is where the consumer ethos is, is, so, is just so simply destructive of, of churches and other kinds of organizations because I'll stay in that group as long as they agree with me. Well, then you'll never be any smarter than you are now. You need to stay in a group despite differences and disagreements. Now, it doesn't mean you, you stay in come what may. There's only there's a small number of 
situations like that, but you stay in and you hang in there. And I talked to, you know, Grizz, Griswold Grimm and I said, you know, go to a church and, you know, it doesn't matter if you don't like the music so much and it doesn't matter if the preacher should have stopped after 30 minutes and, and it doesn't matter if well, those things do matter. And if you can find a church that's better, it's obviously better. And but but I'll tell you, you will not find a perfect church because it's not out there. And any church that you join, you'll have to tolerate. But what you should try to do is is bond yourself with a, a semi-healthy community and stick with them and pour into them. You know, and we've been dramatically unable to do that as families for the last 50 years. People are repeater, non-player characters in many ways. And unless and until something transforms, of course, this is reason in C.S. Lewis's Miracles. You might say, reason? That sounds like Sam Harris. No, it's it's reason. Something, something stops us. And, you know, in the words of, what was the guy in, you make me want to be a better person. Well, Helen Hunt and Jack Nicholson and as good as it gets. You make me want to be a better person. Well, why? Well, because there's I see a vision of myself that that I think only you and only being tied to you makes that happen. And it's commitments like that and relationships like that that change the world. Somebody pointed me to a The Next Big Idea podcast with Sam Harris and Rufus. I don't know who Rufus is. I'd never heard the podcast before. Sounded like a big podcast. They had sponsors and everything. Um, but it was 2010 again, and and there was Sam Harris. You know, Rufus is like, you know, you know, he was he sounded so 2010. It's like Rufus, hadn't you heard of Jordan Peterson? He'll do a number on this fandom of yours. But, you know, again, I heard how many times, well, we atheists need an institution like the church. And there's the Sunday assemblies and there's all these attempts and it goes back to Compt. And, you know, and they just keep failing. They never scale. They never, they never make a sandbar. They never build an estuary. You know, what we really need is an institutional, we need songs and rituals and communities, just none of that woo. And you'd say, it's it's the woo that keeps you there. It's the swelling of your heart. I want to fall in love with someone, but without any of the woo. And it's like, do you understand what it means to fall in love? And I just think, these are very smart people. What kind of stupid culture has made them so dumb? And I'm not, I'm not just pointing fingers here because the church had the West and lost it. What does that say about the church? Why am I promoting a loser organization? It's because I haven't seen anything better to replace it. You know, maybe ask why this never works. It's easy if you try. You know, how things scale up, we... We, we Voltron, we, we scale around a person and that person, that leader sort of becomes the seed and, 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 but it's a crystalline formation and the pattern of the person gets, gets replicated in the pattern of the crystals that grow around the person. And, and, and this, this travels through time and, and people then, you know, the, the person is an individual and becomes a principality. And again, of course, I'm a Christian, so pardon the application, the easy applications for me, but the Apostle Paul talks about us being in Christ, and it's a remarkably weird thing to say. And he doesn't say in Jesus. And the, the whole idea, and this is part of what the Apostle Paul is talking about, the whole idea of the renovation of the idea of Messiahship that the Gospels are all about, which is which is not that the, the Messiah is someone who, think about Greg Boyd's power over versus power under, it's it's not the power over. Power over doesn't sustain itself through time because there's always someone else who wants to get to the top of the heap and they're willing to they're willing to kill to get there. It's power under. It's the sandbar. It's the estuary. It's the slow development and the slow giving of all of the all of the tiny little organisms that become the limestone. 
And, and this is what changes the world. You know, and somehow you try not to lose the thread, which you invariably always will. And so then this this process of reformation that Tom Holland discovers, and you just you just find it. And and Jesus says, You have heard it say said of old, and you know, Nathan the prophet admonishes David and and um Ezra and um I'm forgetting my my Bible stories, you know, the, the book of Deuteronomy is found when they're renovating the temple and, and Ezra, you know, reads the law to the people and, and Jesus comes and says, if you knew Moses, you would recognize me. And, and it happens again and again, the thread is lost and it's regained and people come together and, 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 and the world is shaped and transformed. And, and you might say, yeah, we don't have the time. Well, we don't have the time not to either if we don't have the time. And this is always a, a mixture of, of competition and cooperation, which is, which is why to read church history, it's all a bunch of church fights. And, and that'll be true of every religious organization. But, but that's how, in fact, the, the storyline is maintained and, and not lost through all kinds of decadence and decay. And, you know, this even works in negative examples. It's just how human beings work. There's tons of negative examples, and people are messy. I got a picture of Jim Jones up here. Talk about a negative example. And, and there's all kinds of them. And 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 people are messy, and when they, they make a mess together, it's a huge mess. But you keep working through time. And every time I hear Brett and Heather talk about Chesterton's fence, I think, have you read the rest of it? Do you understand what that fence means? We're in community with the dead, and we have to be. We give them a seat at the table, and, and we receive their gifts, and, and we try to live up to them. And yeah, they might not have been, we might exceed in some virtues that they haven't, but they far exceeded us in virtues that aren't terribly popular today, yet virtues they remain. And so if you want to save the world, you got to do it together. Now, you know, again, I at the end of the video that I did with with David, and we'll see if he posts it. Um, you know, it's it's up to him. But you know, I, I think I think the the work that that any of these these groups do in terms of community, that's the most important work. And you know, I'm, when I when I look at the when I pop into a a voice chat that has somehow randomly appeared on the Bridges of Meaning Discord server and they're they're working out something that might sound boring to half of the people that say, oh, what are they talking about? Oh, they're talking about this or they're talking about that. I'm not interested. Yeah, but the people, the five or six people in the room are interested. And 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 you're not going to find, you're not going to do that cohesion. You're not going to find that that learning and the meetings of the mind and all of the and all of the knitting together of trust. If you don't have these small spaces in which to, which to cohere, you know the the smallest community, just of two, is the most generative. It's how babies come from, right? You don't find it with three, and you find it with difference: male, female, two, baby, right there. It's what happens. It's how the future is born, and and you know my sermon that I preached on honor your father and mother. Your most godlike parent, your most godlike neighbors are your parents. I didn't say they're godly necessarily. I said they're godlike. Why? Because they they bring you into this world and they form you. Just caught a little wisp of of uh, Glenn Scrivener's uh, conversation with an Orthodox priest, and you know the teaser that that Glenn puts up front is you know choice. None of us none of us chose to be born. None of us choose to die, or most of us don't choose to die, but. This, this, this freedom we imagine we have, come on, you know, use a little reason, recognize it. And so, yeah, I, you know, I've been, I've been watching David and, and his work. And again, I just wanted to say, you know, keep at it with the community side. Keep at it with, with people talking with one another. Yeah, I understand it gets boring. Yeah, I understand there's monotony. Yeah, I understand things are repetitive. Yeah, I understand there's some people that are really brilliant and other people who are not quite so brilliant. I get all of that. And some people should be on their meds and some people are just plain destructive. And at some point you might have to show them the door. I get that. But 
It's long, patient, slow work, but build that community. And, and as I said to David, speed and size and haste are not necessarily your friends. Better to grow slow and grow well than grow fast. And, well, you know, I'm sure some of you medical people out there can talk about diseases where you grow very quickly and the body has a pace at which it best grows. Now, again, I'm not unbiased in this. You know, I actually don't think it's a fair fight because Christianity is growing like crazy in Africa, in Asia. And and when I work, you know, yeah, I, I encourage people to find a church and they go to churches and it's a mess and, 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 and. But, you know, I people find their way. Maybe they find a little Orthodox church or they find a little, find a Roman Catholic church or they find a little evangelical church or a mainline church or an Anglican church or they find something and they build a relationship and and, and, and things start to knit together and the sandbar starts to form and the, the whole shape of the wave is changed. There's loads of trouble with the church, but there's a huge installed base and, and, and it's fast growing in parts of the world. And again, almost always when it's fast growing, there's there's all kinds of lousy stuff growing with it. And, you know, having been on, on a missionary, you, you know, there's always, always this imbalance. The, the West has all of these books and all of these brains and none of the vitality. And the developing world has all of the vitality and, and not much of the history and not much of the knowledge. And there's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a huge mess, but... Are people any other kind? So just keep spreading and dying and rising and crossing cultural boundaries over and over and over again. So, so yeah, to the to the lovely people who, uh, well, to all you lovely people who watch and who talk and who gather and who um, don't give up the habit of being together. And speaking the truth in love if you can. And figuring out how to relate to one another. Whether or not you have a YouTube channel or or some other thing. Or a YouTube channel with 1,600 subs or 15,000 subs or, or, or 4 million subs. Yeah, keep talking, keep doing, keep forming those little bonds. Build that sandbar. Change the shape of the ocean.